At Work Australia would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and pay our respect to elders past and present. This podcast is being recorded in the southwest and western Australia, which is land of the Noongar people. We'd also like to pay our respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from wherever you may be listening from. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Candid Conversations with Sean. In this episode, I caught up with Sharon Whip. Sharon is a neurodiversity expert from Team Cohesion. Uh, She provided lots of great insights on how we can support neurodivergent people in the workplace. I had absolutely loved my conversation with Sharon and I'm sure you're going to take lots of valuable information away from this episode. So please tune in and I hope you enjoy. Thanks so much for taking the time to come and have a chat with me today about neurodiversity and how we can better support neurodivergent people in the workplace to hopefully be able to create more employment opportunities for them. Thanks for having me. To get things started and to give our audience a bit of background into yourself, do you mind talking a bit about your employment history, your experience supporting people who are neurodivergent? Oh, of course. So it started about... Oh, 16 years ago when my daughter was diagnosed as autistic and I had absolutely no idea what that meant. Um, And unfortunately, it wasn't easy to find out what that meant uh, because there wasn't a, a lot of information available to me. And not only that, as we now know, every single person on the autism spectrum is different. And so, you know, knowing what that meant for my child, as opposed to the general autistic population, you know, it was difficult to know. So I did feel like it was a big void there. And so I set about, I guess, uh, making it my mission to learn what autism meant. So that started my journey. I guess when you first got the diagnosis, was there a lot of supports available? Were there people pointing you in the right direction saying, you know, this organisation can help you do this and these people can help you do that? Or was this sort of information you have to go out and find on your own? You do have to find it on your own. Obviously, there's great organisations like Autism in Queensland and places like that that you can contact and they'll, they'll give you information. However, back then, 16 odd years ago, We were not as well informed as we are now. There's such a lot we know now that we didn't know then, which is a great thing. So it was really difficult to find information. But also back then, the funding that was available for supports for your child was very much only directed as early intervention. So that was really great if your child was one to five. There was a lot of money being spent on early intervention for autistic kids, but there was nothing for older children and certainly nothing available for autistic adults. Then I started working in autism and employment in 2014. And actually, I'll even go back to 2013. So I was working in an organisation where I was able to bring stakeholders together to try and collaborate on, you know, a known issue to see if we could come up with some solutions. So in 2013, 2014, I started an autism collaboration table, bringing together all of the major stakeholders in autism and education and employment that I knew of in the Southeast Queensland region. And at that point, we identified that there was three challenges. The first two and most significant challenges were communication across agencies. It wasn't as easy as it should be to find information and to talk to other autism agencies. Everyone was sort of siloed working. So communication wasn't great. There was no sort of employment pathways and established employment pathways. And there was the other thing is that we weren't really good at teaching our autistic young folk self-determination, self-awareness and self-advocacy. So the ability to say, this is what I need. So those were the three things as a group we decided for what we wanted to work on. And then it's my career started, just to summarise it really quickly, I started working for Autism Queensland, which was fantastic. I then moved into the DXE Dandelion program where I managed up to 22 autistic people in a professional work environment for 
you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, and saw firsthand the challenges that those employees faced and also the co-workers. So I did that for five years before moving over to work for Untapped, where I worked on a pilot program that looked into the the challenges that a disability employment service might have in placing an autistic person in sustainable employment and seeing how what I'd learned from my experience, how that could be brought over and, and help um, providers. So I did that for two years um, and I also I spent a couple of years developing, writing and implementing some training programs that have been run nationally and globally. And um, this year just started my own company called Team Cohesion. Um, and Team Cohesion is very much about having an aligned approach and shared responsibility for cohesiveness. And by that, I mean, obviously, our autistic people have to learn, you know, s- some of the expectations of the work environment. But so do the workplaces. There's expectations and and there's a responsibility on them to learn about the autistic person's needs in the work environment. And it has to be a two-pronged approach for it to be successful. So the services that I offer at Team Cohesion is, you know, services for the autistic job seekers and employees, as well as services for those co-workers and employers that support them. Yeah, I think, you know, in the workplace, we come across people from all different backgrounds and regardless if a person lives with autism or has any other form of disability, we need to be able to get to understand their barriers or their differences and learn how to work with that individual. People without disabilities can be difficult to work with, clash with the personality, but you still have to learn how to work with those people. So people with disability and with autism should be no different to anyone else. You're so right, Sean. And, the, you know, I've worked with large employers, small employers, and I've worked with disability employment service providers, you know, a range of different people. And everyone, without, you know, exception, wants to do the right thing. There's no one out there who's maliciously going, I don't want to support an autistic person at work. I've never heard anything like that. But what I think I see a lot is people are, are nervous and they don't want to say the wrong thing. And that can be both sides. So you've got your autistic person who, who doesn't want to be seen as less capable, who doesn't want to be asking for stuff, you know, because they don't want to be seen as needy or getting more than they deserve. And then you've got, you know, co-workers and managers and employers who don't know how to say things when things go wrong. And so that's where I see all of the issues are around that side of things. So people want to do the right thing. They just don't know what the right thing is. So that's where I want to help. Well, hopefully by today, after listening to this podcast, people will be a bit more informed and feel a bit more confident and hopefully have some guidance to know what to say. You know, sometimes people don't know what to say, but saying nothing is sometimes not the option either. So oh, that's need, exactly need to fix- right. And I, I know a lot of, there's a lot of different terminology associated with neurodiversity. So do you mind explaining a bit about exactly what is neurodiversity? And I hear a lot of terms like neuronorm, neurotypical, neurodivergent. What does all this mean? Okay, I'll try to to give you a bit of an overview. There's a number of different uh, key terms um, that we could talk about. So firstly, let's start with neurodiverse. So every single person on the planet is diverse, has a neurological diversity. None of us have the same brain wiring, so we're all neurodiverse. Those of us who haven't got a diagnosis of a neuro variation, such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, we can be called neurotypical. Then people that do have a diagnosis use the terminology neurodivergent. So neurodiverse is every single brain is diverse. Someone who is diagnosed is neurodivergent. Uh, And then, of course, we have autism. And it's really important to know that the preferred language around autism and that there was research done across Australia around this and the predominant terms are autistic or person on the autism spectrum. A person with autism was not preferred and that is gives the sort of a connotation that a person is walking along with a bag that has their autism in it, you know, yeah. whereas an autistic person is saying, I'm autistic, I don't carry my autism with me, it is who I am. So there is a preference for autistic over person with autism. Well, I was yeah. just going to say then, the way 
you explain the the neurodiverse that everyone's neurodiverse then if we're to say we're trying to increase the neurodiversity within a workplace would that maybe not make sense because everyone within the workplace is already neurodiverse well i get where you're coming from but a- another way to look at it as well is there's a neuro majority so i heard someone say and i don't have any research or statistics to give you here to validate what i'm saying but someone once said to me autistic people in particular are the biggest minority group across the globe but certainly a uh, neurodivergence uh, people would be the biggest minority group across the world. So what we're talking about here is we've got a neuro majority, so a non-autistic person or a, a neurotypical person, and then we have uh, neuro variations which are in the minority. Now, what is a problem is that all the rules and expectations and all the communication within a work context, and I guess more broadly, a community context or school context, university, it's all set up for neuronormative expectations. So does that make sense? So everything is set up for this set of expectations and rules that is never taught to a neurodivergent person, but we expect that they will know that and adhere to those rules and expectations. I mean, like the standard workplace behaviours that are expected by an organisation or the rules that we're expected to follow within the community that I guess a lot of people, they might just come natural. You mean they're, they're not explained to a That's person right. who is autistic? That's exactly right. And there are some behaviours that have to happen, aren't there? All of us, regardless of culture and, you know, neurotype, there are some expectations that we have to abide by. Like we can't harm people and, you know, yell and scream and do those sorts of things within a work environment. Um, So there are expectations that we all need to abide by. And so, yes, we may need to explain what those are. But the things that really bother me that I see happen way too much is that an autistic person is let go. I've got my fingers doing inverted commas there. They're let go because they're not a team player. And being a team player is coming in in the morning and saying, how about the football last night? And what did you do on the weekend? How hot was it? Did you see this thing, you know, um, and and that small type stuff or let's go to the pub on Friday afternoons or let's all go out to lunch and your autistic co-worker may not do that. So they're seen as a not a team player and then let go. Yeah, the social yeah. aspects that come along with work where That's um, I guess right. an autistic person goes, I'm coming here to work, not to socialise. That's exactly right. And I'm really nervous and anxious in that noisy environment where, you know, communication within a social context, what are the rules to that? If someone yeah. says this to me, what is the rules in my response to them? You know, history shows me that I will answer this wrong and I'll offend someone or I'll say something that's seen as rude or blunt. So I'd just rather not be in that environment because, like you said, I'll just stay here and do my work because that's what I'm paid for. I understand the rule of that. So then they're fired for not being or let go because they're not a team player can seem as, you know, rightly so, very unfair when, you know, so so an aut- from an autistic person's perspective, someone once said to me, that sort of communication and socialising can be seen as quite arrogant and confronting for an autistic person. So we're expecting someone to tell us all about what they did on the weekend and how they're feeling and come along and talk to us about this and that. And it can seem quite aggressive to an autistic person. And I'd never really thought about it from that perspective before. And I think even, you know, you think about the way Australians speak to one another, there's a lot of banter, there's a lot of joking back and forth in the way we communicate. So that could even be even more confusing for an autistic person because they might not get the small jokes or that a person was joking, they're not being serious about a comment that they make. That's exactly right. I had a beautiful employee that I once worked with and he said to me that he'd been given a job on a building site and this young man never passed probation you know, um, and no one ever told him why. So he was 30 odd and still didn't know why he'd lost, you know, a a whole heap of jobs prior to this. Anyway, got a job on a building site and a a manager said to him, hey, will you just jump on the end of that piece of wood? Now, you and I probably know what that means, but he, he jumped on the piece of wood and then was laughed at and made fun of. Yeah. 
And, you know, see, that just breaks my heart, that sort of stuff. And it happens way too often, you know. And so that's the disability right there, those sorts of behaviours. That person takes the exact meaning of that sentence, jump on the piece of wood, not to go and pick it up and help him carry it. That's exactly right. So you understood that. But imagine living in a world where things like that were said to you all day, every day. And you didn't quite know what they meant. And so you tried your best, but you still got it wrong. can be quite demoralising. And I guess that can also come down to their colleagues not being aware how to best communicate with an autistic person as well. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. That's probably a good segue into my next question for you. I attended one of your webinars last week and you spoke about four of the common differences that autistic people face in the workplace. Yeah, sure. Do you mind explaining what they might be? Yeah, and again, this is just from from my experience. Of course, every single autistic person is different and that difference can change depending on the work environment, their stress levels, all sorts of things. But the main four areas that I supported autistic people all day, every day, across all the different programs I've worked on are, well, communication is, you know, perhaps number one and the biggest change that if anyone can take away from listening to this podcast, if you can just think about the words you choose, then I'll be happy. Most of the issues that come up in the work environment can be solved or averted by, you know, effective communication. So communication and social interaction, there is definitely a difference there. So autistic people receive and use language differently. So we've got to think about that from a cultural aspect. So someone who's from India, for example, or anywhere overseas, they receive and use language differently. It's a cultural difference. So we need to think about that for autistic people as well. Um, So number one, communication. Number two, And this is one that I spent so much of my time supporting both neurodivergent people and their co-workers is around, uh, it's a term some of you may have heard of, and it's called executive functioning, which is the brains. All of us use our executive functions. Uh, Some people refer to it as our CEO. So our executive functions are what keep us organised, helps us start tasks, you know, be organised, plan, manage our time to maintain emotional control, manage stress, be flexible in our thinking. Those are executive functions. And if you have challenges in any or all of those areas, um, that's known as executive dysfunction. And That is differences due to brain neurology. So I can't stress this enough. I think we think that if someone forgets an appointment or if someone doesn't bring the paperwork they're supposed to bring or they turn up late or they get really stressed over, you know, you having to give them some feedback. We tend to judge that person, whereas we've got to understand it's the way that their brains are wired and that we may need a different approach. And it's not because the person's lesser than. We have to make sure that we never do it in a condescending way. And as a parent and seeing a lot of other parents um, of autistic kids, we can do a bit of a disservice sometimes in that we are we operate as their executive functions. So, oh, if I don't organise this appointment and if I don't make this phone call for my child, if I don't do this, it won't happen. And I understand why I'm guilty of it. I do it myself. However, we have to be really careful that we don't become someone's executive function because we're taking away their ability to enhance those skills. So potentially um, you have to let, I guess, with all children, sometimes you have to let them learn by their mistakes. If they miss an appointment, they don't follow up on something, they, hopefully they'll learn from that next time. Well, yes and no, because what that can do for an autistic brain is then go into that self-loathing. I forgot it. I'm hopeless. I knew I'd forget. Everyone hates me. Everyone else can do it. Why can't I type mentality? So what a lovely lady that I worked with said to me once, which really resonated with me, is that all of us 
use tools to manage our lives. So, for example, even turning up for the podcast today, Sean, if it wasn't in our calendar, if we didn't get a reminder 15 minutes before, if we didn't pre-prepare what we were going to talk about and say what our objectives were, you know, it wouldn't have happened. So we use tools to support our time and our effort. If we're someone who runs late, we may have to put a reminder in our phone for an hour before to go, you know, don't forget your things in an hour's time. We have to rely on an external tool to support our executive function. So it's the same for an autistic person. So within your sort of um, industry, you have to understand that for executive functions to work optimally, you need to be not under duress or stress um, and be worried about things. And so, unfortunately, the job seeking is one of the most stressful things you can have to do. And so, you know, a lot of autistic um, clients may be feeling stressed when they're talking to you. So, there are uh, ability to manage their thoughts and be organized and remember stuff, you know, and manage stress can be somewhat sort of impacted. So we need to be mindful of that. But and we can also put supports into place, such as I will send you a reminder one day before that to remind you that you've got to do this thing or fill in this paperwork or that we're going for an interview. And now, again, I I come back to that never being condescending because it's not lesser than. It's just that a brain is not wired the same way. Um, And it can be that have so much activity going on that it's hard to focus in on, you know, things like that you've got to remember. So by just putting a few simple things in place like reminders, don't worry, I'll send you an email about that. And in the work that I do with Team Cohesion, For example, I never ask anyone to go away and do something before the next appointment because I know that's actually going to be quite stressful on the brain. So I I try and do everything together. And so that person leaves not thinking, oh, my gosh, what have I got to do? Oh, no, I've got to do that and I don't want to do it. And What exactly did she ask me to do? So I just try and minimise stress on an overtaxed executive functioning. Um, So there's lots of things we can do, sending emails. Another thing to think of right at the moment, it doesn't really match with executive functions, but is phone calls. So I want you all to know that a phone call can be really disorienting for an, an autistic person if it just comes out of the blue. So, you know, what tends to happen is when the phone rings, a person can feel really stressed and not want to pick it up because who is it on the call? What are they going to ask me for? You know, there's so much ambiguity and uncertainty about that phone call, so I just won't answer it. And I once had a a beautiful girl I was supporting in the job readiness journey and we had done interview practice and we'd written a killer um, resume and cover letter and we'd looked for state government jobs and we'd applied for a job Um, in the state government and she actually got an interview but she never picked up the call and never answered it and then by the time she got around to answering it it had closed well the opportunity had passed so that was could have easily been averted by an email or even better a text saying hello it's Sharon from Team Cohesion I would love to talk to you about your application um, and actually do an interview with you it'll take 15 minutes can you tell me a time that is good for you then the person has some control over that situation and can be prepared for it Young, that young lady then went into self-loathing. I'm hopeless. I'll never get a job. You know, so it can be a bit of a vicious cycle then. And I just said to her, oh, that's amazing. The resume worked and the cover letter worked. That's terrific. Let's not let's not dwell on, on that. We know it works and let's just keep applying for the next one. So going back to the four things. So we've done communication and social interaction. We've done the um, executive functions, which is the way we receive, interpret, process, remember information is different. So yeah. check for clarity. What was it I just asked you for? And when are you getting it to me? Because then you can see if there's any gaps of information. 
I believe something else I've heard you say as well, that autistic people, they process information differently as well. Well, that's right. And I I just read something this morning and I, I really love this. And it says the autistic mind may register more information. However, this information may be registered, interpreted, stored and communicated differently than that of a a non-autistic person. So they registered lots of things, the sounds, the smells, you know, all those different noises that are going on. However, you know, it may be stored and recalled and interpreted differently. And so just check for clarity, um, send reminders. You know, those are the sorts of things that we need to, to do to better support autistic people in what is a very overwhelming journey. That leaving school, finding employment is I think, confusing. I think that, that whole journey can be overwhelming for everybody. You know, you leave school, you don't know what's next. There's a lot of uncertainty. When you add additional barriers on, it's going to cause even more stress. So the more of these barriers and challenges we can take away to make to streamline the process, it's going to create more opportunities for people who are autistic. Yeah, you're so right. The other two, the other out of the four things that I've noticed um, are commonly different. The third one is sensory experience, which is hopefully not a new piece of news to anyone listening to the podcast. You know, so an autistic sensory system and an ADHD as sensory system is programmed differently to that of a neurotypical person. And it, it takes in information from the senses and interprets it uh, and creates an output based on that information. So, and that can be interpreted differently. It can be overwhelming. Uh, so, people can be hypersensitive, so overly sensitive or hyposensitive, so may not be sensitive to touch, for example. And people can also be sensory seeking or sensory avoiding. We hear a lot about being sensory avoiding, so they don't like the smell of something. They can't work, you know, in a cafe with bacon or um, things like that. So they're sensory avoiding, whereas you can have sensory seeking. So it could be someone that really loves to dress really brightly and have really bright red lipstick on um, because that makes them feel better. So, So they're seeking that visual sense. So that's something that I oh, actually worked with someone. Here's a, here's a really good example. So I actually brought on a team of 10 autistic people to work with me. One of them was a, an autistic man who was sensory seeking in food. So he loved food that was really crunchy, really loud, really quite smelly, things like tinned eel. He ate um, dried duck's feet, very strong Asian smells. And he had dried fish. So he, after starting wow. work in, a, in an office with me and the other nine autistic people, he went out to the Asian supermarket and came back, you know, with these two big bags of food, which he started putting in his office drawers. And the other nine autistic people just came up to me like, I can't deal with this. It smells. It stinks. And so long story short, I had to do up a, he was a 30-odd-year-old man, but I, I did up a sheet for him saying what could be eaten at the desk, what could be eaten in the tea room, uh, in the lunchroom, and what couldn't be eaten at work at all. Because when he was eating dried duck's feet in the lunchroom, everyone got up from the table and left. And that really upset him because he was left sitting on his own, but he had no real understanding of why. I said to him, well, mate, I don't know that there's any office in the world where you can sit there and just munch on dried duck's feet without people being challenged by that. Oh, okay. It's it's a bit unique. Um, I know. I didn't even know those sorts of things existed. But he was sensory seeking. He needed smell and taste and crunch when he ate. And so he would then go shopping and come back with his shopping bag and say to me, okay, tell me where all of these sit on my chart. And he was grateful for my honesty. So, yes, so sensory seeking, sensory craving. So that's the third area is sensory. And the fourth is mental health. 50 to 70% of autistic people also have high mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. So, I mean, anxiety and depression is high um, amongst the general population. We know that. But 50 to 70% of autistic people 
have a quite debilitating mental health condition at some point in their life, if not, you know, ongoing. And so we need to be aware of their experience. Um, And the last thing we need to do is go, it's not that bad. You know, it's all right because that's like saying to an autistic person, hey, don't be autistic because for them it is bad and it is overwhelming and they are really anxious and upset about something. So um, we have to be aware that that is their experience and support them. You you can't tell a person that they can't feel a certain way. Everyone's experience is different just because it might not be stressful to you. It could be overwhelming to another person. It's just understanding um, everyone's and accepting everyone's differences, I guess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, So, yeah, it's coming back then to focus. And I'm really glad you brought this up because I'm guilty myself of using terrible language in my training 10 years ago, eight years ago, such as black and white thinking, so referring to autistic people as having rigid thinking, black and white thinking, not being flexible, those sorts of things um, when I was running training. And then a few years ago, an autistic colleague told me about monotropism. And it was one of those things that changed, you know, my mind on that. So what monotropism means is it's a focus style, which tends to be quite an autistic focus style. So monotropism is a distinct approach to attention preferred by autistics, which explains the fluctuating attention intensity based on an individual's interest and motivation level. So that means that an autistic mind tends to have its attention pulled more strongly towards a smaller number of interests at any given time, which leaves fewer resources to other things and other processes. And so monotropic mind may have difficulty quickly changing its attention. So if you imagine you've got a brain that's really super focused on a task and it's really seeing all the details and finding all the patterns and really trying to do a really good job. And if someone says stop doing that now and go and do this, it's going to take effort. So because it's the brain is wired to super focus on a thing and that super focus gives a bit of calmness and joy especially if it's something that the person's really interested in and enjoying. And that's as opposed to a polytropic focus, which is pulling in multiple strands of information at any given time. So someone who's polytropic is, you know, tends to have a, you know, a broad attention span and can hold many multiple interests in their mind um, simultaneously and can have you know see what's happening over there and and hear this conversation yeah. and, and and incorporate that into what I'm doing and and I've had autistic people that I've managed in a team environment there could be something really major going on in the team you know like really major big something or other and we're all talking about it And then you'll say to an autistic person later on, oh, this thing that happened, what thing? And that's because they're so engaged in their work. And so what I would do in that instance is if I need it, so a monotropic mind can work for 10 hours straight without break if it's doing something it loves, which is, hello, it's, every yeah, employer would yeah, love exactly. that in one way, in one way, of course, we don't want to overwork people. But what you need to do in Having that, that case, ability about a focus for such a, a long period of time is an asset. very valuable. It's a strength. Very Incredibly. valuable. Yes. And, and both of those types of focus are very valuable, aren't they? So a team that incorporates monotropic focus and polytropic focus is your ideal team. But you need to understand each other. If you're making you know, a monotropic mind, be polytropic, it's exhausting. I guess Um, that um, the monotropic mind becomes more like a specialist, you know. I've heard an analogy before that an autistic person, they're not a jack of all trades, that they could be a master of one. They specialise in a specific area and become absorbed by that topic. And I think, yes, you're right, but at the same time, I think they can become a specialist in a range of things. It just needs a different approach to training and managing that. So you can't expect a monotropic person to go and do this and then go and do that and then go and do this. You would say, okay, this is what I need you to do. Go away and do that for the next four hours. And then after that, we're going to look at this new thing. 
And you just know that in those four hours, that person will focus really well on that. Whereas your polytropic people are over here getting distracted by this, that and the other. Um, so look at, Trying to multitask. Well, yeah, yeah. And look, they're both effective, but they both need the right work environment. So for me, I would say I'm a bit more polytropic. So sitting me in a work environment where I get no distractions, where I just sit there and do the same thing all the time and really focus on it wouldn't be great for me, I don't think. I like it sometimes, but um, I like diversity and I like to move and, you know, think, move around and do different things. Likewise, if you put a monotropic person into, you know, a busy shop where every single person that comes in is going to ask a different question and, you know, they're going to have to think of lots of ambiguous questions concepts and analyze and make decisions based on you know an unknown set of rules that's not a good fit so it's just about yeah. placing those working styles in the environment that's right for them yeah allowing people to be able to work to their strengths 100 percent. yeah if we can shift the conversation a bit around to communication because i understand that sometimes people autistic people can sometimes be misunderstood or they might be direct with their communication or they might not make eye contact with people when they're communicating can you explain why it is that they communicate in that sort of style and 100 percent. so i don't know the exact statistic on this but a really high percent as much as 70 to 93 percent of communication is non-verbal so have a think about that so 70 to 93% of communication is not the words. It's the tone. It's the facial expressions. It's the sarcasm, the, you know, all of those different things, the body language that an autistic person may not understand because it's, it's not clear. So neurotypical communication tends to have a lot more emphasis on nuances, eye contact, and tone whereas autistic people tend to not like eye contact and why that is is because looking at someone in the eyes distracts from listening to the words so it can actually if someone's not making eye contact it probably means that they're concentrating or listening harder because eye contact will be distracting um, and interfere with focus and concentration. Not always. So some people can just zone out and be bored. That's that's the general population. And if in doubt, you can just say, you know, are you listening? Do I need to explain this differently? Whatever. But I would often have like a, an adult colouring book or fidget toys for the people who preferred to be able to talk whilst doing something because it helped it helped them to be able to communicate with me. So I found that was helpful for some people. But certainly lack of eye contact is does not mean disinterest or not listening. It could in fact mean the complete opposite. Autistic people have far less emphasis on tone and nonverbal cues uh, that tends to be more focused on the words that are used and I'll give you some more examples of that which you'll love from the training that I ran last week so autistic communication is quite effective in terms of um, autistic people tend to speak to the facts and gives priority to important information. Now, that is the facts as they see it, of course, and the information that's important to them. And they tend to be straight to the point about that. And of course, that's often interpreted as rude or blunt. And the other thing is autistic people don't see the point of social padding in communication. And so, non-autistic people tend to use a lot of social padding to soften our messages. So we might be about to go into a meeting where we're going to say something really harsh to someone, but we'll start by, how are you? And how's this weather? And, oh, you look lovely that's today in that dress. Talk. Yeah, and it softens the content. However, an autistic person sees that as irrelevant. And again, you know, it can obscure meaning, it can dilute the meaning of the message, which then makes it confusing. And I, I know I've done this, and I know I'd still do this. You know, we do tend to try and soften messages where it's sometimes it's just better to say it as it is. 
I guess if you if you look at it from their point of view, is someone's coming in telling you that they really like the way you've dressed today, you're talking about the weather, and then they go and deliver some bad information. You're gonna be like, well, a second ago they were my friend, and now they don't like me. How it could be hard to can be very confusing. Yeah, absolutely. And I gave an example last week in my training, a beautiful autistic ADHD uh, lady that I worked with. Uh, She was a highly professional woman, very, very smart, very accredited uh, lady, beautiful co-worker. But she had no idea how to use social padding in an email. Emails can be a really confusing area in general, for autistic people, how to write them, what to say, how to not be blunt, all those sorts of things. It's it's hard. And she knew that neurotypical people expected some sort of social padding as an entry to an email. She had no idea what that should be and why it was needed. So what she did was she put a cute photo of a puppy in every email. And then she said what she had to say because she thought, she said, no one will be angry with me if I've got a puppy in my email. (laughs) It's such a beautiful story, but it's also really sad that the responsibility is on her to make a change to keep neurotypical people happy. Therein lies the problem. And, you know, and so a better way would be if for some reason she did send an email that was seen as blunt or rude well one you look at was that her intention no well then sort of get over it a little bit but, but what about if, in this yeah what sorry? about the situation you know she's communicating with someone who doesn't know about her condition or that she's an autistic person how do you how how are those situations handled you know if, yeah, you know, if, if look, it's between two colleagues who are aware of the barriers go oh yeah that that's just how she communicates but i guess if you're communicating it's tricky, isn't yeah. it? It is tricky. And the, it's an area that, you know, comes up with issues a lot, unfortunately. And I think, uh, you know, I'd love to see workplaces that were more aware of an autistic communication style. And I think I think we're moving towards it. And we do a lot of cultural programs already, don't we, where we're actively trying to recruit First Nations people and more women into certain tasks and, you know, people from other countries and low socioeconomic areas into roles. So it's the same sort of thing. We can do it. Um, It's just that it's different thinkers. So in that instance, I would hope we would have, you know, buy-in from a manager who would explain it and would be able to, if there was a problem, would be able to explain, look, there is a difference. If the person is saying something offensive well as a manager we have to tell them regardless of neurotype that that was offensive and it's certainly something that I've had to do in the past is say well this is how that was perceived perhaps a better way to have written it was this and usually the person goes oh wow of course thanks for letting me know so we really need to look and think about the intention behind the communication and perhaps just ask the question yeah, because I was going to say that I've heard you also mention last week that autistic people, sometimes they might not be aware of what their strengths and what their barriers are. Oh, we, we don't, unfortunately, teach our neurodivergent people what that means for them. So we might say, yes, let's do all your testing. You've got your diagnosis. You're autistic. A person goes, oh, great. I finally understand myself. Well, probably they don't go great. They probably have an internalized negative stigma about what autism is. But okay, well, now at least I understand, you know, why everyone sees me as differently and why I don't get it. But that's about the conversation. We don't say, well, let's tell you what that means for you within an education context or, or what that means for you in a, in a work context. And so a lot of autistic people I know are going through the disability and employment service when I was doing the pilot, it was a high percentage, like 65% didn't want to disclose their diagnosis to the employer and that then means that and I understand why they don't want to because it hasn't really worked out for them in the past and I'm just going to make a fresh start and I'm going to make it work but it just does mean that they can't access support when they need it and so I would like to live in a world where you know a person could say hey I'm autistic and the manager would say well hey what does that mean for you and the person would say well I just need really clear communication Um, if there's going to be a change can you please let me know you know can you communicate really clearly to me and the manager going yeah of course and that those conversations 
would just be ongoing and natural and flowing. I feel like as well, you know, if a person is up front and shares that they do, that they are autistic and it's not well received from an employer, it's probably a good sign straight away. It's probably not going to be the best workplace for them and they're probably better off to try and find the right workplace if they want to have the best chance of being successful. Yeah. I think if you think about it, and this is my beautiful daughter, this is her experience. So She's beautiful and smart and she's doing medical laboratory science at university and it's not easy for her because she's having to fit into neuronormative expectations and she's working doubly hard as everyone else. Anyway, but she she got a job uh, on her own with a a big laboratory and she didn't disclose and she was one of a, a small group of people that came on together to work in blood testing in a laboratory. It was a six-week training and, um, like I said, there was a group of them and at one point, about day three or four, the manager said to her, hey, when you finish doing what you're doing, can you come over and we're going to watch this training video? And so my daughter interpreted that as I'll finish what I'm doing and then I'll go and watch the video. Then when she went over to watch the video, the manager was really annoyed with her and said, well, what what have you been doing? We've all finished watching it now. And she completely finished what she was doing. So she came home, self-loathing, they're going to fire me. I knew they'd find me out. Here we go. It's happened. So as a mother, I'm sitting there faced with the, oh, my gosh, this is a dream job. She'll be really good at it. You know, she's going to lose her job. So my advice to her was to go in and disclose. She didn't want to have to disclose. But I said, if you disclose, you know, perhaps it's going to be less likely for them to fire you because they might try a bit harder. And so the next day she went in and she went in and, and knocked on the manager's door and he said, oh, hello, come in. And she walked in and she said, I'm autistic, just like that. I said, oh, okay. Again, no social pay- padding. Yeah. But when you think about it, how do you say it? Oh, yeah. you know, how are you going? Yeah, look, I've got this neurological thing called autism. How, how do you say it? It can be, yeah, it can be t- very challenging um, conversation. And how do you manage that information when communication is hard for you? Uh, luckily for her, he had an autistic child and he said, oh, okay, you know, I've got an autistic child and tell me what that means for you, right? So it worked out for her. But it just gave me a real insight into we're putting all of that responsibility on ha- on that using that information and giving that information and managing that information on an autistic person who is diagnosed with a neurovariation that means it's a struggle to communicate, you know, and understand other people and, and read cues and things like that. So you're asking a disabled person to do something that is their disability. I'm not explaining it well, but it just really explained to me how hard it is for someone to to just come in and tell someone I'm autistic. And then if they say, if it's a good outcome, they'll say, well, what does that mean for you and what do I need to do? And then you need to be able to say that. How do you think that could have been done differently? Well, the great news is we're starting to work with children now uh, and we're helping autistic people to understand what they need a bit a little better and certainly in my career and at team cohesion I work with individuals to try and help them understand that Um, so whereas they might have said I'm forgetful and I get really stressed really easily I'm not a good employee I'll go okay that's actually your executive functions and if you do this and this you know, and you are placed in the right work environment for you, you'll be fine. You know, the other day someone said to me, I've been coaching him for a little while, um, and he said to me, oh, um, his provider suggested I go for this call centre job. And he said, and I don't think that's a good fit for me. I went, oh, that is music to my ears because it showed that he understood that that was difficult for him but that was not because he was lesser than, it just wasn't the right fit for the way he worked. Yeah. And that he could had some control, because we're all about choice and control. He had some control over. So he's got his parents saying, you've got to get a job. You're 30 and you haven't got a job. Oh, my God, what are you doing? Get out of your bedroom, go and get a job. 
and then he'll go in to see a provider. And I'm not saying any provider's right or wrong. I know everyone's working really hard, but a provider will say, what do you want to do? What are you good at? He'll go, oh, I don't know. Well, could you talk on the phone? Yeah, because I'm not going to say, no, I can't talk on the phone because then you won't give me a job yeah, and you'll course. see me as incapable. And so that's in an area of the executive functions called metacognition, which is one of the most important things is, you know, if you think about an autistic person, then they may not instinctively get what they're good at and what they need support with or what is really not a good fit for them. And they may overestimate their abilities or completely underestimate their abilities. And so we do need to provide some observation and support. And I think it could be hard for anyone to really decide what career path they want to go down. You know, whoever really truly knows what they want to do until you try something, until you try a job, see if you're like, this isn't for me, I'm going to try something different. So I can just imagine how much more difficult that must be for a person who is autistic. Well, and imagine if you let go with no explanation. And so the, you just are never told what you didn't do well or what you did do well. And so you just go to the next job and do the same thing and you can let go again and then you go to the next job. And if no one's saying to you, hey, you shouldn't be saying your political views in that restaurant as a complete random example but if no one says hey can you not talk to, about politics to every customer that comes into our shop then that person's going to not going to stop doing that that uh, might and be so their that, passion yeah so in that case i would say to someone you cannot talk about politics at work and i'm not telling you you can't have your views and your passion about politics please do but at work the rule is You can't talk about it. And they'll say, why? Because it's an area that's up highly contentious. It's up for debate. Everyone has very individualised opinions. It could get you into hot water. And I wouldn't use that because then they're envisaging being in a pot of hot water. But, you know, it could get you into trouble. And, you know, an employer doesn't want a customer complaining about a staff member talking about politics. So the rule is... You can't talk about it. Very clear. If they talk about it again, then their behaviour needs to be addressed because you've told them the rule and they're still choosing to do the wrong behaviour. But if you've not told them beforehand, you know, how do they know what they're doing is wrong? And those are sorts of conversations I would have on a day-to-day basis with both sides not just an autistic person, with a non-autistic person to say, you know, relax. They don't have to say hello to you in the lift. They're not being rude. They just, you know, don't want to talk Focus to you. Focus on a what co- they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And if we do now discuss employment more specifically, you know, you've mentioned some key statistics today, but what other, you know, the unemployment rate for a person who is autistic is significantly higher than another person living with disability, even higher than people who don't live with disability. What are some of the other common statistics um, with autistic people and employment? Oh, gosh, there's a really great research piece done by Amaze a couple of years back that I, I don't have in front of me at the moment. I'll, I'll give you the statistics that I, I know off the top of my head. So the most important one is that autistic people are the most unemployed across the globe. Why is that? Because of the communication differences and the executive functioning differences. So an interview is a, a social dance and we never teach an autistic person the steps. So an autistic person will go in, you know, dancing the tango and the interviewers wanted the waltz. And so it's never going to work out. So that's one reason when when an autistic person gets a job, they often don't keep the job for a myriad of reasons, mental health challenges, not being supported. Perhaps they do all say the wrong thing. It's not the right work environment. So, So autistic people are the most unemployed across the globe. The United Nations know that. They speak about that a lot. It's a global issue that we need to look at. Uh, so autistic people are three times more likely to be unemployed than a person with a, another disability and six times more likely to be unemployed than a person who doesn't have a disability. Some other statistics are coming through uh, the NDIS at the moment, uh, some recent data about the NDIS is uh, 31% 
of participants accessing the NDIS have a primary diagnosis of autism and then there's more who have a secondary diagnosis of autism. So it would be higher than that. And 65% of 7 to 14-year-olds are autistic. So 65% of participants in the NDIS in the age of 7 to 14 are autistic. So those people are going to be looking for employment in the next few years, uh, and yet autistic people are the most unemployed, and so we need to do something. Something needs to change. And just talk to us about what are some of the strengths that an autistic person can bring to a workplace? Oh, gosh. Look, can I just say from my experience, so, you know, I worked alongside as many neurodivergent people as neurotypical people in my last role. It was just a very neurodiverse team and it wasn't that hard, you know, like everyone can just get along, but then there needs to be education from both sides. So some of the strengths. Okay, I told you all those things about communication before, straight to the point, effective communication, no social padding, other things like not liking small talk and and being very honest. Now, they're all strengths. As an employer, there's an honesty and an effectiveness to that communication style, and yet they're the ones that we keep saying are in the wrong. So tapping into that that very uh, honest, straight-to-the-point communication, I find autistic people to be unbelievably receptive to feedback. When it's done considerately, you know, they're just – I went in to manage a team of – 13 autistic people nine years ago. I did not know back then that those 13 people were going to be the easiest people to work with. It was everyone else around those 13 people that didn't want to change the way they do things, didn't want to, you know, do things this way because this is the way we do it. Those 13 people were the most receptive to feedback and to having conversations and to working, you know, to meet objectives once they knew what our expectations were. Um, So very honest, very loyal, very hardworking. And and they deal with the facts. They focus on the facts. So as a business, that's what you want to deal with. Yeah, you know, they are more drawn to rules, I must say. Uh, so if you – jobs that have well-defined rules tend to be a good fit. And, it's, again, general information here, but it could be a scientist, it could be um, a physicist, it could be an engineer, it could be a stop-and-go sign. As long as it's got the rules – that can be trained, these are the steps you take and there's no ambiguity to that and there's no decision-making. My my sister once told me about um, a lady who worked in a a very, very smart lady but was working in an avocado factory and her job was in a production line, was to get the trays of avocado and take out the ones that were too ripe. And so she she was just hiding boxes of avocados under the table because it was too ambiguous. Yeah, And to make those rapid decisions about is that too ripe or is that it was just too hard a job for her because there wasn't clear enough Too much interpretation. Too much interpretation. You're so right. So um, very rules focused. So if you want someone who's going to follow the rules, there, there you go. And what would you say to employers? What would your number one tip be to try to support an autistic employee? Well, it's, it's really not that hard. If you can just communicate, whether it's communi- as the employer to communicate with you, um, you guys as a provider, that would be a great help. To communicate with the individual in a considered way. I understand your experience. However, this is what we've got to talk about. This is what's got to change. If the, it, communication is number one in my opinion, and we're just, we're just not doing that well enough. Um, and so we're not communicating our expectations. Little things like an employer once said to me, oh, such and such is having three coffee breaks in a morning. And they expect me to go, oh, you're kidding. And I said, okay, have you told him what the rule is about coffee breaks? No. Well, there's your problem. Yeah. Say we have one break for five minutes in a morning shift to have a coffee. 
We usually go to the toilet no more than two times, depending, and we can go and fill up our water bottle three times. And this young man was saying hello to every truck driver that came into the yard. And I said, did you tell them you don't need to talk to every truck driver that comes in? No. Well, they think that's what they need to do. You say we don't usually talk to every truck driver that comes in. And I guess that comes back to that employer not having the confidence or feeling comfortable to have that conversation. And not knowing that that's, you know, an autistic person may not know those unspoken, unwritten rules and expectations um, that we expect them to know. And if we can just translate a little bit, it, it will go such a long way to helping those people succeed at work. Yeah. And as a mother to an autistic child, what would your advice be to other parents who might have just found out their child's autistic or they might be trying to support their child to find their first job? What would your advice be to them? We tend to put, again, expectations on them uh, and say things like, you know, you're lazy, you haven't got a job, get out there. and do. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just wish if we could understand a little bit more about what they're going through and support them. And oh, I guess this a, is a, a tricky a, one for me. And I was going to say, because it might be different because people might have multiple kids and other kids might be non-autistic and they've flourished through school, gone on to find jobs, and then they're expecting the other the child same. just to follow the same path. I guess you've got to understand that everyone's on their own journey and will take their own path in life. And that's right. And use language that is supportive, like is working two days a week success and I think finding a work environment that corresponds with your kids the most important thing. So you could be multi-accredited, multiple degree person who would not cope in a fast demanding job. You might cope better filing. And if that's the right environment for you and you're going to succeed in that, well, that's great. Don't use language that says you're not succeeding. It's about finding the environment that's right for for them. And I guess just helping as much as possible your child to understand their strengths and their needs and, and supporting them through that process. And I know it's easy for me to say that. It's a really hard thing. It's a really hard thing for parents. And they know their kids are very capable, but employers aren't really giving them a go. It, it, it's really demoralising. So I do, I do understand that that's a way too common experience. Uh, and I guess just look at different things. So one of the things I do in team cohesion is I look at upskilling. So I'm talking as an employer now, not as a parent. As an employer, when I'm looking for um, a staff member, I'm looking at someone. I'm looking for someone who's sort of a little bit committed to self development, whatever that might be. Whether it's a little bit of volunteering whether it's doing, you know, an IT course online, you know, free. I'm not saying go and spend fortunes on this thing. But as an employer, you know, I know a lot of autistic people have lots of gaps in their resumes and it's not through them trying to get a job. It's unfortunately they're not given the opportunities. I get that. But trying to um, not give up. And to just try and be developing because as an employer, you look at someone and go, okay, they've never worked, but gosh, they've done this course and that course and they're really keen on this topic, whether it's working in a pet shop or IT or whatever, they're really committed. So let's let's just meet them and see. Um, And then once you get an interview, you have to practice because it's a social dance. And you have to learn what the steps are. So I've developed a, you know, a booklet of the 20 top questions that you get asked in an interview. And we work through what that means, how you answer it, uh, so that people can be prepared for those questions. So we have to spend time helping individuals prepare. We have to ask for the questions. We have to get more employers giving us the questions so we can get our people ready for those questions. So Having a support person at an interview that can translate is another helpful tip. I think that providing the questions before the interview can be very valuable. That way the person knows what they're going to be asked, they can prepare. It takes away the, a lot of the anxiety and it gives them a, a real opportunity to be able to showcase their strengths without having the, the fear of the unknown. 100%. It's sort of a, a, a levels the playing field. 
And in a work environment, we don't often get told, I'm going to sit down and right now and ask you five questions and I want you to answer them and I'm going to compare you to the other five people I've asked. We don't do that. So it doesn't diminish anything. It gives everyone the opportunity to prepare. And, you know, we've got this beautiful young lady I'm working with um, and we went together to an interview and, and we got the questions before. And actually when I called the employer or emailed the employer and said, can you give me the questions? They said, oh, it's just going to be very informal. And they thought that was a really lovely thing to say. And in, in essence, it was. But that gave me nothing to prepare my candidate with. Yeah. And so I went back to the employer and I said, no, these are the three questions I'd like you to ask her. Yeah, had that to um, take that. Yeah. And so then I, I said to the candidate, here are the three questions they're going to ask you. And she came in and it was all on her phone. And she said at the end, you know, I, I've prepared. Can I please read you this? And she read it, looking at the phone, and she read it to them. And they were so inspired by the detail and and forethought and rawness of what she said, you know, and they would have missed that. They would just said, we'll just do a general chat. Now, that's the worst nightmare for an autistic person because that could go anywhere. (laughs) Um, Yes, so she prepared the most beautiful three responses uh, that was they were so impressed by because she was given the rules around what the interview is going to be like. And it was really poignant for them to see what I meant by saying, no, give her the questions. She was lucky that she had you there to push back and going to bat for her with the employer. This next question might be a bit tricky, but in all your experience over the years supporting autistic people in the workplace, do you have a most memorable moment? Oh, gosh, I've got thousands, squillions, squillions, often small little things that generally relate to self-awareness and self-advocating. So I know things that show me that a person knows they have potential, able to say what they need. I mean, that is my greatest joy. I'll give you, honestly, I have so many stories. One that I I talk about a lot is a young man came into one of the employment programs I worked in um, many years ago. He had dropped out, he'd finished year 12, he didn't get a great OP and he was just sitting at home in his room. His sister got him a job a couple of nights a week and he was putting rice in bowls in a Chinese restaurant. That's what he would have ended up doing for the rest of his life. His mum said apply for this job. It was in IT and he came along and ended up getting this traineeship and working with me. He wasn't always easy to work with and he was very blunt uh, in his communication and, and could g- get people offside a lot. He had, a, a you know, sensory challenges and he, he used to wear his coat all, see, all year round. He wore this big coat and he put it over his head a lot of the time and he had to have his back out um, and the coat on so he wouldn't be distracted by people around him. And and so a couple of times even I had to talk to him about behaviour and almost behaviour management plans. And anyway, fast forward two years into the traineeship, something clicked and he ended up getting headhunted by a state government department um, to head up their automation team managing uh, a number of people he was earning I think he started on something like 130,000 a year and he bought a house he had a girlfriend and he ended up recruiting a a number of the other autistic people in the team over to his team which is how it should be right yeah it's that's life you Um, can see their strengths I said to him as he left to go off to that state government job I said to Tell me what you learnt about yourself through this traineeship or what was good for you. And he sat there and he thought for a while and he said, I learnt that I had a potential. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about anything. It was that I learnt I had some worth. Yeah, and see other Um, people showing him the value in the workplace and they they appreciate him for what he's doing and for 
for his expertise. Yeah, he was good at something. He had yeah. something to offer society. And it was so much more than that. He was incredible, you know. And that young man, I used to have to put rules into place. I legitimately had to put it in writing and said, you will leave work by 7 p.m. every <laughs> night. Because he was working to <laughs> one in the morning. Oh, really? Because he'd be so engrossed in fixing this IT problem. And he'd say, why? I don't want to go home. I've got nothing to do at home. And I had to say, but you're going to get in to trouble because if something goes wrong there's no one here to support you and you're here on your own I look like I'm a bad manager because you're overworking gave him all the other perspectives you have to leave by seven now what employer doesn't want someone who's so focused and committed to work that's a good problem to have I guess in in some ways yeah but you can see the flaws to that like you're gonna overwork someone but you know so he uh he is one of my greatest success stories because there was times where you know I thought he wasn't going to make it and he made it spectacularly and we should never give up on on someone's potential and it's about finding that person's potential and for him it was managing an IT department for state government but that's someone's potential is to do an eight-hour shift you know in a factory then that's great you know, it's finding what their potential is and, and facilitating the journey to success. Thanks so much again for joining us today, Sharon, and sharing all of your wonderful knowledge about neurodiversity. If people want to get in touch with you and, and connect with Team Cohesion, how can they reach out to you or get involved? Ah, oh, that's excellent. Thanks so much. At any time, I love talk, talking about this topic. You may have picked up on that. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me um, at my website. It is www.teamcohesion.com.au um, and you can see the different services that I offer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I am able to provide training to employers through some job access funding, if that's helpful for any of your clients. That That is certainly one service um, I'm able to support or I can help with job readiness coaching with people's NDIS funding. So if you've got any clients that um, you'd like some help with, even just some general inquiries, um, you can also email Sharon, S-H-A-R-O-N, at Team Cohesion, T E A M C O H E S I O N dot com dot AU. I'd love to hear from you. And we'll put all your contact details and your website um, within our show notes so the listeners can find it there. Thanks again, Sharon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, Sean. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in for another episode of Candid Conversations with Sean. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Sharon, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Sharon for joining us today and sharing all of this valuable information, which I'm sure everyone is going to find very useful and very informative. If you'd like to connect with Sharon or learn more about how to support neurodivergent people in the workplace, you can find our links to her website and her socials um, within our show notes. Thanks again, everyone, and hope you enjoy. 